Well, I just want to say I am honored to meet Salvatore Pasquale. Yes. Uh, that's not me. That's my cousin. Well, he's here. He's uh, if I can touch the same hand that kind of shook touch, his touch, hand, okay. you know, fantastic he, video. Yeah he's, yeah, he's doing great. He's a little fatter now, but he's doing really well. He's back in Sicily. Oh, can okay. you tell me where he got those yellow pants? Because it takes a strong man to wear Listen, Italian the, an outfit fashion. like that. You, you can, you know, you can't, you'll never go wrong with Italian fashion. Those guys, they know how to dress. They know how to cook, right? And mm -hmm. dance moves. Dancing, yeah. that like was anything impressive. romancing. They just, you know, they're, they're light years ahead of us. Yeah. Yeah. You should tell them that we thought that video was very funny. Even though I don't think he was trying to be funny, but he came off funny. Yeah, he's, uh, you know, he's just, a, he's a little too wired on espresso half the time, but... He makes a good video in the end. That's what's that's what's important. And he knows he has all the connections. You know, he knows the country world. He knows the metal world. Right. You know, brought in all those guys. For so us. he called Sebastian Bach. Yeah, he knows Sebastian, and um, I think uh, his mother's cousin knew Billy Ray Cyrus <laughs> from back in the day, and so yeah, that was good. Yeah, excellent. The good. director's cut, highly recommended. Yeah, yeah, if you haven't seen the bulletproof video, you. Yellow pants. I'm telling you, you <laughs> never thought that they would be hot, but somehow they just kind of are. It's a treat. You've been spending a lot of time over there in Sicily with your cousin, but also like where your family's from. I, I follow you on the gram. I have, yeah. Well, you know, it, and all joking aside, I actually was, I had the opportunity to restore, to renovate the house my dad was born in and grew up in. And, um, you know, it's, it's a long story, but in a nutshell, there was basically an earthquake way back in the day. He moved out somewhere in the early 1950s and they were going to knock down all these places, but um, in 2000, they, the government passed a law stating anything that was considered historical, they would, they would uh, fix the walls structurally and the roof, and it would be up to the owners to renovate. <clears throat> and my great uncle was this famous composer in this little town back in the late 1800s, and he created a music emblem that went over the door in stone, and because of that music emblem, they deemed the place historical. So... I stepped in all these years later without my dad really knowing and kind of got it all put back into the family name and then renovated it. And just um, this this past year, um, I brought him there. And for the first time, he's like, oh, let's go walk by the house. Because, he, you know, he walks around the little town. He relives his childhood. So oh, he didn't know that you had done this, it? did that. And then we walked by the door and it was new. And he's looking and when he looked back at me, I was holding the keys like that. And oh, my God. <clears throat> it was pretty cool. It was pretty touching. You know, he walked in and um, I had the place all furnished everything all the photos of his family when he was a little kid there and his sister and his parents and my great uncle who was this famous composer so I put my great uncle and his band my dad and his band and me and my band so it showed all the generations of music above the piano and it was a really cool moment to be able to give to him you know so well we've been reminiscing a lot just hanging around at the show talking about the last 20 years yeah <laughs> And, yes. and the relationship between the band and the radio station and our relationship, because it was my anniversary too. And Mike, this is your 19th, 19th year, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. So it's like we all have this giant time in our lives that was kind of all spent doing whatever the oh, hell. Oh, because of the magic meatballs. I know. What's the name of the place? Oh, yes. Oh, El Camino. El Camino. In Lemonster. Plug. The, the meatballs <laughs> and the raviolis, magic raviolis. Yeah. Yeah, I was going to bring some today, and I was like, I, I don't bet, know if he's on. Like... she was a roadie. All right, yeah. Yeah, she drove trucks. Yeah. God, I was, was so hot with a crescent was, wrench in my pocket. She was butching around. <laughs> like, damn, who's the girl with the purple hair with the wrench in her pocket? Was she just happy to see me? <laughs> Do you remember the, the first year I was on the air? So you guys signed your contract in, what, May of 98? Uh, June, I think, yeah. And then that October, I was on the air, and it was my birthday. And you guys all showed up at the old AAF studio, like 30 of you. I have Polaroids of it. Polaroids. Polaroids. And you showed up with a keg and oh. all this crap that you brought into the studio and a giant pack of maxi pads. Really? And you ah. stuck them <laughs> all over the studio. And I was live on the air and, and all of a sudden you guys just kick the door in and you just come running in and you stuck a maxi pad like on my forehead. <laughs> And you brought balloons, and yeah, I have Polaroids of it. That's amazing that I don't remember any of that. <laughs> <laughs> I need Man. to scan them. But it is crazy that now you guys are on this big When Legends Rise 20th anniversary tour. 
Yeah. And you go back and look at everything that's happened in the last 20 years, how radio's changed, the music industry, how your own band has changed. How, how radio survived. Right. <laughs> but like, but it's just a completely different world than it was 20 years ago. Yeah. I have fucking Polaroids. I know, I know. <laughs> I mean, I, I got to tell you, we were just reliving some of the memories a little while ago, and, and I was thinking when we started the band, um, CDs were just starting to come out. Because every all the bands up until you know that point, we all had our demos on cassette tapes. What was that like? Ninety one, ninety two, ninety. No, no, it 90? was mid nineties. Like we formed in ninety five, ninety six. We started cutting some demos, um, and then by late ninety seven, we recorded the first record. But we recorded it as a CD because we were just like, oh, all these other bands have these things called CDs and they're shopping them around and we should have a CD and, and they're a in photo. these long boxes. Oh, that's and, right. that, and that's how it started. And so we, 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 we just kind of recorded, you know, 10 or 11 songs um, in, uh, in this basement studio in Boston right behind Fenway called New Alliance Studios, which is no longer there. It's right next to the liquor store and not the liquor store. It used to be underneath the liquor store next to McDonald's on Boylston. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So behind there, right? Um, and, and below those condos now, whatever they are. That it's like was, over by the baseball tavern, yes. right? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, right behind it. So that's where New Alliance was. And we recorded it, you know, for 2,600 bucks over a weekend and, and put it on a CD and shopped it around. And that's how we started to get some phone calls from you guys to Rocco and all that back yeah. in the day. And that's how the whole thing started, so. We were joking with, with Robbie earlier because you guys sent those demos to everybody. Right. Yeah. And yeah. and it's almost you had to make a few changes, but it's almost the exact same recording that became the debut album of Godsmack. It is the exact same recording. We never re-recorded it. We just remixed it and put it back on the shelves six weeks after we signed a deal. Yeah, and you had to take like some stuff out of Moon Baby, didn't you? We weren't there like samples or there something was, yeah, you had there, to pull you're out. Right. There, yeah. We had a remix. That's what we did. So because there was some um, samples that I had taken from a movie. And, and uh, we couldn't get permission from Gary Oldman, is what it was. He didn't want to, <laughs> he didn't want to give us We had some talking samples in there, whatever. Um, some of them we got to keep and we got licensed for, and then some of them had to go. But, um, but oh, if you get a copy of the first demo CD, um, it's the exact same CD. We just changed the artwork and put it back out, but it didn't, the first one didn't have whatever on it. Right. Whatever hadn't been written yet. We had the CD out, we were selling it, and then we came up with this other song, and Rocco actually heard it, and he's like, that's the single. And so we recorded it onto a single CD, and then we elastic banded it to the CD that was selling at Newbury Comics. Yeah. And, and that's kind of how, that's how the first single got out there. But we were joking about how many people you mailed it to that denied you, that mm -hmm. turned you down. Yeah. And then Everyone. the same album gets released and sold what five million copies? How many copies yeah, did it sell? Yeah, something like that. When you when they were when they were like shooting it down, w was there any point where you guys were like, oh, I don't know if this is going to work out, or was there any like doubt about the future of the band? You know, no, I don't think so. Only because we we were too busy just working and trying to fly our the clubs on Lansdowne Street when we knew there was other bands playing there, like why Zombie would come through or whoever, and we would just be, okay, rock shows, we got a flyer, and tell them about a gig we're doing and things like that. And so we just got really immersed in that, and, and when the blinders went on, you know, we weren't thinking of getting rejected. We would just, time was passing, and we weren't hearing from anyone is what it was. So it never really gave us a sense of doubt, but um, I, I do remember the the show that changed our whole train of thought with it, which was Corn playing at um, Avalon, and next door was Axis. Yeah. Right. That's how it was. Which back is then. all the House of Blues now House for anybody that doesn't yeah. know right. what that was. So House of Blues was Avalon, and next door was Axis, and we were playing Axis, but we didn't know who Corn was, and the place was packed. So what we did <clears throat> was we told the people in Avalon that. Anyone who wants to come in after corn's done with their ticket stub gets in for free. And so, you know, 10 minutes before we go on, I come down the stairs, I peek in, and there's like 13 people, like, oh, we're so screwed. Went back upstairs, stretched out a little bit, came downstairs, and it was packed. There was probably three, 400 people in there. Everyone dumped out of Avalon, came in, got drinks or whatever, and watched us, and no one left. And I just remember thinking, wow, no one knows our music, no one knows who we are, but we didn't lose one single person. And that's when we were like, you know, we might have something kind of special here. So that was, that was, that was a, a bit of a pivotal point for us. And you've been through, I mean, when you look back at 20 years, you look at successes, failures, 
you know, you guys took a break for a while and started, you were working on your solo stuff and all of that. The band comes back, you release this album, you get all geared up for your big 20th anniversary and just walking around this tour, it seems like everybody is just in this place of, holy shit, it's been 20 years, how awesome is this? You guys all just seem like you're getting along better than you ever did, you're happier than you ever were, the band sounds better and is playing better than they ever did. Where does all of this come full circle? Like, it's been so much stuff, and then to end up right back where, I mean, in bigger Everest. venues, yeah. 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 Well, I think me and you were talking about a little while ago, you know, experience comes, wisdom comes from experience. It comes from living. It comes from, you know, just kind of trudging your way through life. And for us, you know, we, we went through, I think, every obstacle that every band has gone through, maybe some of them not quite as excessive with, you know, the drugs and the dope and all that stuff. But we certainly had our pockets of like really bad, you know, drinking problems and some drug stuff or whatever, but the egos and the fighting and all the stuff that usually breaks up a band. But, you know, somewhere along the line, we just figured out that it's better to go and get some help and work on these things. And long story short, we've, I think we've gotten over a lot of those mountains that tip a band upside down and they break up over because no one wants to like, you know, give in and the, the egos get in the way and the pride and all that. <clears throat> but we're so far past that now and it really did come full circle where we, we just, we're back to like enjoying the music and enjoying the moment like we did back in the day when we would jam in the garage with your girlfriends coming over and you're drinking beer and you're just, you know, sneaking weed behind your parents' back or whatever. <laughs> and, and it was, and it's that now, like we get up there and we really have a good time. There's no, we don't really care about the theatrics of the show and all that so much. You know, we do some cool stuff and choreograph some things power wise or whatever, but it's really just about getting out there and, and, and playing and having fun and enjoying the moment because we know you know, now some time has gone by and we don't, we don't know how long this will last. And it's really important that we stay in the moment, you know, because when that new young next band comes along that takes everyone's place, you know, we'll kick their ass too. Because <laughs> <laughs> you have that, that uh, again, going back to when you guys are first starting out, did you have that, where li you didn't have that living in the moment thing? Did you have no. that where you're like, oh, this is happening right now? For me, after I, that first album took off. I always got lost in what the next step was, you know? So when we were, oh, if we could just get a record deal, then we're there, right? And then you get a record deal and you realize you're at the bottom of the ladder of the big time now. And then you're like, oh, well, wait till we get a tour bus because then at least we can travel in comfort. And then you get a tour bus and you go, okay, if we can just start selling clubs around the country now, then we're there. And then that happens, then you go, oh, but when we get to theaters, the production will be so much better. And when we get to arenas and it keeps going, and then Paul Gary steps in one day, our manager, and he goes, guys, you're going to miss the whole moment because you're always whining and complaining about the next step and trying to, like, you're missing it. This is the times you're going to miss the most, playing in these clubs, playing in these theaters, you know? And, and he's right, like, you know, time goes by very quickly and, and we reflect on that now. And we're like, oh, there was some really fun times playing the Rat and Axis and Bill's Bar and all these like places that, you know, there was a point where we became the buzz of Boston. And but we didn't know, you know, we were so immersed into just trying to shit. We ran out of T-shirts, so we got to get more T-shirts or whatever. Um, you guys played CBGB's. CBGB's. Yeah. I mean, when you go back and look at iconic venues and pivotal shows, to, to be able to say, like, yeah, we took busloads of our idiot friends from New England down and played CBGBs. Yeah. It's legendary. So, so grateful for that one, too, because now that it's not there, it's like... That's what I mean. So like, yeah. there are kids wearing T-shirts with the CBGB logo that will never be able to even know. They'll just think it's a John Varvato store, and they will never know. And you can actually say no. We See, I feel that way about the rat, too. When I drive by now and I'm like, it's that restaurant or whatever it is now. Yeah, hotel it's like the hotel. And like, they have oh, a rat suite now. I'd like to just go in the Do basement. they really? Yeah, so it's a suite, a couple of rooms put together, and they have pictures of bands from back in the day. Uh -huh. And so it's kind of a tribute, but at the same time, it's like, you know, whatever. I a mean, it was the night. most dingy, rotten, stinky place, but there was just something about that place that... It was the most underground, cool Boston bar, you know, one of them for sure. And uh, I miss those places, the channel, you know, all that stuff. So, Did you use the bathroom at CBGB's? That's the true I'm test sure of a I band did. right there. I'm sure that needed the chili, right? 
Uh, yeah, you didn't want to eat. Yeah. Well, I so, didn't sit on the toilet seat, though, with my bum. <laughs> <laughs> guys get to stand and just aim. So yeah, we, tell yeah. me about it. You really? Tell hover. me about something I don't know about, Sully. You're going to hover. Yeah. <laughs> it's nasty. Quads. It's all of the quads. <laughs> you got to get the good quads. But going back and looking over, looking over everything now and all of the shows that that you know you guys have played that AF's been a part of is there obviously you don't remember the maxi pad incident on my birthday yeah, how could i not remember I that know, by the way how do there? i not remember sticking yeah. a maxi pad <laughs> on a girl's face i don't know and i was live on the radio and i was like thanks silly you just stuck a maxi pad and i think the noise of you ripping it back off i'm pretty sure it's like, traumatizing it, well it's it was in the microphone yeah, ptsd <laughs> That noise. Every time you have to use one now, you're like... <laughs> but when you go back and look at the early days, like, what is your best WAF Godsmack memory? Was it hearing your song on the radio the first That's time? That's definitely one of them. That's the first one that came to mind because I remember going into our little tiny baby rehearsal room in Methuen, and um, and I was starting to turn on the lights, and I had this little radio in the corner, and it was always on AAF, and um, I was waiting for the other guys to come in. And a couple of them showed up, and then I remember hearing Keep Away come on. Because, again, whatever wasn't written yet. And I just remember we all hovered around the radio, and it was, again, it was Rocco, you know, talking about this new band and pay attention to these guys and whatever. And then they played Keep Away, and I was like, oh, my God, this is amazing. <laughs> Do you uh, guys need therapy for being dads of teenagers? Like yes. <laughs> yeah, I'm 14. 14? Yeah, yeah, she's 14. Yeah. The boys yeah. are starting to come yeah, into the picture. more years. Skyler's coming to the tip of winding down you know yeah so i think in the next couple of years it's gonna pass but 14 really is yeah that's the beginning yeah. and i don't know anything and i'm an idiot and i hate you and then when she's like 20 and she needs some bills paid you're the, you're a genius yeah it'll flip don't worry <laughs> i i you know our band we're all layered so tony has the oldest kids and then Shannon was below him, and then I was below Shannon, and Robbie's below me. So we've all been able to kind of prep each other along the way because everyone has girls. Oh, and what's going that's on. how it always happens. So we've seen Rockstar Tony. Revenge, Tony man. Tony's daughter's here too tonight, and she's all mature now and super cool, and everything's good. And she even looks back and go, "Oh boy, was I a pain when I was 16." <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I remember the first time when it hit me was Skylar was at my house and we were hanging out. She was there for the week or whatever. And she was just in a mood and like, it was just relentless. And finally I'm like, what is your problem? She's like, you need to take me to CVS right now. And I go, why do I get it? Oh, okay. Never mind. Really? You'll bring maxi pads to my that's birthday. Karma. That's karma. That's what you get. Yeah, that's karma. That's, that's karma. what you that's get. That's a God smack. That's right. <laughs> that's exactly that's the, right. I'm like here's twenty dollars. That's yeah. this. You, you don't come here on that week anymore. I, I don't want to know. Ever. Uh, <laughs> go, okay, go in. I'm not going in with you. We were sitting down with Brent from Shine Down a little while ago, and he was going on and on about you know talking with you about putting this tour together and you know your albums coming out around the same time so I wanted to ask you about them because he couldn't stop talking about what a fantastic tour this is and how great you guys are to tour with and what awesome friends you are. he just I don't know if you paid him but he was really <laughs> nice about everything so what's your side of, of what's your perspective of being on the road with those guys? Yeah, no, they're great, man. You know, we, we've been friends for a while now. I think back in 06, I want to say something like that. They, they came out with us and that's when we first got to know each other. And um, we've been really um, proud of them and watching their evolution and them coming into a headlining status themselves and all that. And I think it's really great. And I'm really glad because I think... Um, we need more bands like that to continue to wave the rock and roll flag because there's some bands, a lot of bands are going away, you know, sooner we, we don't have Rush anymore. We don't uh. know how long Aerosmith's going to do this for. Metallica's starting to teeter about some things because James doesn't want to, do as much, as much touring. Well, plus we're like, losing singers like Chris Cornell and Chester, Chester Bennington. Yeah. And, and so there's all that going on, right? And so, you know, I think it's important that, um, that, our, our style bands stick together and continue to support each other because we're all on the same team, you know? The better they do, the better we do. The better we do, the better they do. It's all relevant. You know, back in the day, people didn't really understand the meaning of, you know, they think pop music is Justin Bieber and Madonna or whatever it is, but pop is just means popular music and so back in the 80s it was motley Crue and def leppard and all that and that's what was dominating the radio waves so that's what pop music was then and so um 
I just think that uh, it, it's great. I love seeing like Hailstorm growing and, you know, all those bands that I've admired and I really thought had something special about them, you know. And as you know, Brent is probably one of the greatest singers in rock it's music. It's unbelievable. So, um, you know, it's it's been really good. You know, it's definitely was a, a lot of work and a lot of, um, you know, uh, effort to put this together. But again, you know, he's right on the money. We, we spent some time talking about this and like, what are you going to do? So we know, so we can contrast you and make sure that both sides of the audience gets a full headlining show, but completely different, but can yet live on the same stage. And I think we did a really good job at accomplishing that. He, um, he was also saying that, you know, you, he watches you guys and it's kind of like a, a healthy competition going on. I like the fact that it's like healthy competition because every single night we're like, I'm coming for your ass. Is there any, uh, right. <laughs> Listen to me, pal. <laughs> Come on now. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I was, so is there any, obviously there is some ball busting on the road. <laughs> and some healthy You know what we do? We look at the merch numbers every night and go, hey, you guys beat us by four grand today. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and, then the, and then they go, oh, what do you mean four grand? You got us by 40 in Mexico, <laughs> New Mexico. <laughs> it's, there's usually some, you know, goofing around. But for the most part, um, yeah. It's been good. We've had a, you know, a great run so far. You know, we're just really excited because these shows are selling great. I mean, it's just the attendance is really, really strong. And, and that's all we care about. You know, we want to just make sure that uh, we're filling these rooms because it is a great show. And, and it's I, I think it's probably one of the best rock packages of 2018. I mean, the fans seem to love the idea of us partnering together. The promoters really loved it. And and um, and. Uh, it seems like everyone's having a great time on this tour, you know? I mean, I I don't see any problems, and I hope it continues because it's it's a, it really is a good package. I think both bands and the music complements each other really well. And it's completely different, like I said. You know, they have this more new digital style show, and we're a little bit more analog, you can call it. <laughs> we're old. <laughs> is That's that what the Polaroid. Means? We're old. Uh. You want to see the Asper Cream? Uh. <laughs> cream in this room. Asper cream, we have biofreeze, we have ace bandages. It literally smells like the New England Patriots locker yes. room when before we go on stage. Dude, when you I know it's been 20 years, but it can't be lost on any of us that we're sitting backstage at Great Woods. I know. And you're playing the stage at Great Woods. Great like Woods. this is what it used to be called back in the day when it opened. I still call it Great Woods. Yeah. It but now instead of being the person that bought the ticket, that stand, that stood in line to buy the ticket. Now you're the person on the stage. You talk about coming full circle 20 years later. Yeah, I've, I mean, I've seen a lot of my childhood bands here, you know, and I've seen a lot of great concerts here, and it's a great venue. I still love this place, you know, and um, it's very surreal sometimes to come home. You know, sometimes you get so caught up in the touring and so caught up in what you do every day with the work thing that it's nice to tap the brakes once in a while especially in your hometown or close to it um and there's just always a little bit more of a special feeling when we play at home for me you know we play in front of some amazing crowds and there's definitely some d gems out there for sure in, in the world but there's just that one extra little thing that happens when you're at home that you know you feel that electric kind of moment and there's just a sense of real just feeling really proud when you're walking onto the stage and you're looking around and you're going, wow, like we built this thing literally from scratch and did it the way we've read about rock bands doing it. And it's, you know, it's a pretty proud moment. More pressure playing at home, maybe that's it? A little more you know, pressure? It used to be that, but again, we've gotten over a lot of that stuff now, you know? And we have, thankfully, we have a great crew in place that helps us with a lot of the guest lists and the moms and the dads and the friends and the cousins and... Because um, they're all here. And they all want to talk to you <laughs> yeah. for a yeah, long that's time. Right. <laughs> they forget that you have to play a show, yeah. and so that becomes exhausting. But um, but no, it's it's great. You know, we have no complaints at all. We're, and you know when you go on stage tonight, you bring up the Patriots. Huh. You're not going to piss off a bunch of people and end up in some viral video in Dude, Seattle. I let it rip the other day in New York. I let it rip in New York, upstate New York. I oh, was boy. just slamming Eli. I had to give him one little moment, though. I'm like, all right, listen, you did take away our undefeated uh, season, which we really hate you for. <laughs> but, man, is he sucking lately. 
<laughs> and I was just slamming them with Tom Brady stuff, and they were just booing the crap out of us, which makes me feel amazing. <laughs> it's the only time I love being on stage and being booed. I just absorb it all. It's beautiful. Let the hate <laughs> flow oh, yes. through you. Bring oh, it's so good. Well, we know you have Asper cream to apply. Yeah. You got family to see and stuff to do, and so yeah. we should probably let you go. Well, but I, but I am noticing the sticker behind you. Did mm. you notice that? It's very cool. It's heritage, man. I know. I, I found one of the old original ones in a case a while back, and it was so old I couldn't peel it off to stick it anymore. It was stuck <laughs> together and ripped. But it was one of the old original Godsmack Sons with WAF in it. it oh, was yeah. Pretty cool. It was like one of the first things that we ever got done by you guys when the band was just signed, I think. So. It's very cool. Yeah, man. Well, thanks for letting us invade your space. Of course, anytime. Thanks Appreciate for not it, sticking man. a maxi Congrats. pad on years. my forehead. Oh, you know I love you. <laughs> uh, night's still yeah, young, Carrie. I know. It's on the right. It's been a long road, me and you. <laughs> oh, shit. We still look good. <sighs> I look pretty fucking good. <laughs> so do I. Let me tell you something. Cindy, uh, Cindy Crawford eye cream. That melon <laughs> Does that really work? The Dr. Sabag melon You see melon any wrinkles stuff? on this right there? That's no 50 years old. And aspirin cream.